All right, so let's continue with the special senses and let's talk about the sense of vision, starting with the anatomy of the eye. Your eyeballs, which are located in the orbits on either side of the nasal cavity, I think everybody is familiar with their eyeball. Each eyeball uh, occupies the anterior one third of the orbit. Uh, there's adipose tissue, which provides uh, protective cushioning for the eye keeps the eyeball in its proper position, and that adipose tissue occupies the posterior two-thirds of the orbit. Uh, for those of you who have been in lab and you've uh, dissected the eyeball, you saw there's quite a bit of fat on the back side of the eye. Uh, the orbit contains several accessory structures, uh, which play roles in protections and functions of the eyeball. The eyelids, uh, which are uh, clinically referred to as the palpebrae. Uh, there are two of these uh, thin folds of skin. They cover the anterior region of the orbit. Uh, they prevent access of foreign objects and distribute the tears when blinking. That's one of the reasons we blink all day every day uh, is to spread the tears across the surface of the eye uh, and keep the eye lubricated. Uh, the eyelids have a couple of uh, outstanding anatomical features. Uh, thin pieces of dense, regular, collagenous connective tissue uh, that reinforce each eyelid, referred to as the tarsal plates, uh, and then the tarsal glands, uh, modified sebaceous glands uh, located within the tarsal plates. Uh, they, secrete, they secrete the oils that prevent the eyelids from sticking together. Uh, when you close your eyes for an extended period of time, like when you're sleeping, sometimes those oils will begin to solidify. And when you wake up in the morning, you know, your eyes are kind of sticky and stuck together. And you have uh, a little a collection of gunk in the corners of your eyes. Uh, that's where that comes from. Uh, the eyelids, medial and lateral commissures are canthy. That's uh, where the upper and lower eyelids meet. The lateral, lateral caruncle uh, is a fleshy structure at the medial commissure. It contains sebaceous glands that secretes a whitish lubricating substance. If you look in the corner of your eye next to your nose, you'll see a little sort of knot of uh, tissue. That is the lacrimal caruncle. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the orbicularis oculi is the muscle responsible for closing the eyelid. Uh, the levitator palpebrae superioris uh, is the muscle that is responsible for elevating the upper eyelid. Uh, and here are all of those structures, actual picture of a human eye, then of course the artist's rendering of the same. Uh, there is your eyebrow, levitator, palpebrae superioris muscle, orbicularis oculi muscle. There's the tarsal plate, the tarsal gland, which we mentioned, the superior palpebrae, the inferior palpebrae. There's the lateral commissure, doesn't show very well on this particular uh, P. There's the medial commissure so showing the lacrimal caruncle that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the eyebrows and eyelashes uh, are protective structures that have the following features. Excuse me. Sorry for that. I thought I could turn that off. Uh, <clears throat> but these are hairs on the ridge of the brow form the eyebrows. Uh, these represent prevent uh, perspiration from running into the eyes, reduce glare from bright light, and they are important for facial expression. Uh, the eyelashes are stiff hairs on the edges of the eyelids. They have uh, very sensitive nerve endings, uh, which causes blinking uh, whenever an object touches the eyelash. Uh, <clears throat> evolutionarily, uh, that plays a role in reducing injuries to the eye. When things get too close to our eye, we tend to blink uh, rather uh, vigorously. The conjunctiva, which is the thin, continuous epithelial membrane uh, on the surface, uh, on the inside surface of the eyelids, lines both posterior surface of eyelids and the anterior surface of the eyeball. Uh, it's a translucent membrane with many tiny blood vessels. Uh, the palpebrae conjunctiva covers the eyelid's inner surface. Uh, it turns back on itself to form the bulbi or ocular conjunctiva, which covers the white part of the eyeball. 
Uh, if you've ever had a disease called pink eye, the clinical name for pink eye is like, like conjunctivitis. Uh, and that is the conjunctiva is what is uh, infected during pink eye. The lacrimal apparatus produces and drains tears from the eyes. The lacrimal gland is located in the superior lateral region of the orbit, posterior to the, to the conjunctiva. The job of this structure is to release tears and mucus into the tiny duct system. Uh, those tears then enter the conjunctival sac when stimulated by the autonomic, autonomic neuron. The function of tears is to lubricate and wash away debris. Blinking sweeps the tears medially and inferiorly. So that's toward the middle and toward the bottom across the eye surface and drains into passages that leads into the nasal cavity. One of the reasons we, your nose starts to run when you're crying is because all of those tears are going down into the nasal cavity. Uh, the tears first enter tiny openings called the lateral puncta uh, in, in the medial edge of each eyelid, leads to the small ducts that empty into the lacrimal sac. The lacrimal sac, which is located in a small depression in the lacrimal bone, drains then into the nasolacrimal duct. From the nasolacrimal duct, it travels through the lacrimal and maxillary bones uh, and then opens into the nasal cavity just below the inferior nasal conchibone. Again, here is the lacrimal gland. There's the lacrimal puncta right there. There's the lacrimal sac, nasolacrimal duct, and then there's where it enters the nose. So the tears are produced here, drain into the eyeball where they are collected here, and then drain down. So when you're watching a sad movie and you start to cry, the excess, the excess, not excess, excess tears gather here, and you get a nice runny nose when you're crying. The extrinsic eye muscles, there are six eye muscles muscles that are attached to the eyeball. Um, they insert in the outer layer of the eyeball. They allow for very specific movements of the eye. Uh, there are four rectus muscles. The superior, I think it's on top, inferior on the bottom, lateral on the outside edge, medial on the inside edge, all of these muscles extend from a common tendinous ring on the posterior wall of the orbit and go to their respective insertion sites on the eyeball. Each of these muscles moves the eye bear eyeball primarily in one direction for which the muscle is named. Superior and inferior rectus muscles move the eyeball medially in addition to superiorly and inferiorly respectively. In other words, the superior moves the eye up into the middle. The inferior moves the eyeball down into the middle. The superior oblique muscle travels from the posterior orbit along the medial wall and through a fibrous loop called the trochlea before inserting into the superior lateral upper and outside aspect of the eyeball. It contracts the contraction of this muscle depresses the eye and moves it laterally. In other words, it makes you look down and away or down and out the outside. The inferior oblique muscle originates from the medial floor of the orbit. It inserts on the inferior lateral aspect of the eye. Contraction up here. This muscle elevates and moves the eye laterally. So the superior oblique muscle is used to look down and to the outside of your body. The inferior oblique muscle, you look up and to the outside. So when you're in the eye doctor's chair and he's acting, you, asking you to look up and to your right, uh, that would be with your right eyeball, that would be the superior, excuse me, the inferior oblique muscle. And when he wants you to look down and to the right, that would be the superior oblique muscle. Uh, the intrinsic eye muscles uh, allow for very precise movement of the eye. Uh, these muscles use a 
large number of small motor units uh, consisting of two or three muscle fibers. Uh, the muscle fibers come from basically three cranial nerves. Uh, you have cranial nerve four innervates the superior oblique muscle. Uh, cranial nerve six innervates the lateral rectus muscle. And cranial nerve three uh, innervates the remaining four muscles. So we get innervation from cranial nerves four, six, and three. Uh, a condition known as strabismus or lazy eye. Uh, is a disorder present at birth. Uh, the eyeballs are not properly aligned with one another, uh, and this kind of condition leads to uh, diplopia, which is the clinical term for double vision. Everything seems to be, you have a sort of a, 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 a shadow image of everything as you are looking at those things. Um, one of those uh, helpful hints uh, if you remember LR6, SO4, all the rest are three, which means uh, the superior oblique muscle is cranial nerve four, the uh, lateral rectus muscle is cranial nerve six, all the rest of the muscles are cranial nerve three. Uh, the eyeball itself is a hollow sphere consisting of the outer wall that surrounds several chambers and supports the lens. There are three distinct layers to the eyeball. There is the fibrous layer, there is the vascular layer, and then there is the neural or nervous layer. Uh, here is a cross-section of a typical eye showing the fibrous layer. This is the outside. If you took, uh, if you've been in lab uh, and you tried to cut into the eyeball and you found it was very tough, that's the fibrous layer. Um, the white part of the fibrous layer uh, is referred to as the sclera. The frontal clear portion of the fibrous layer is called the cornea. Uh, inside that layer, you see there, here is the lens. Within the lens, you see the pupil. Uh, there's ciliary bodies which attach everything. There is what is called a crotoid coat, which we will talk about a little bit more detail in a few minutes. Uh, the neural layer is the retina, uh, and then the vascular layer is made up, again, of the iris, that's the colored part of the eye, the crioid, and the ciliary bodies. The fibrous layer is the outermost layer, has two components. You have the sclera, which is the white part of the eye, covers nearly the entire eye. It is made up of irregularly arranged collagen fibers. It is very, very resistant. Uh, it does not change shapes very well uh, from internal external forces. Uh, again, the sclera fits that structure function core principle. And if you'll we'll recall, we've been talking about the structure function core principle all semester. Things are made the way they are so they can do their job, and they're able to do their job because of the way they're made. The cornea is continuous with the sclera anteriorly or to the front. It is translucent. Uh, instead of uh, an opaque due to parallel arrangements of the uh, of collagen fibers, it is avascular, which allows light to pass into the eyeball. So what, what, it, what it is that makes the cornea clear as opposed to white is the white part of the eye, all of these collagen fibers are arranged sporadically. They go all sorts of different directions and they lay across each other, etc. In the cornea, all of the fibers are parallel to one another. Uh, and again, here is a cross-section showing the sclera, that's this sort of pink area, and then the cornea is this area in the front. The vascular layer or middle layer lies directly beneath the cornea and the sclera. The components of this, this structural feature are the crotoid, crotoid, excuse me. Uh, the most extensive component contains capillaries and pigments. Uh, it minimizes scattering of internal light rays. The ciliary bodies uh, are continuous with the choroid body. Uh, contains rings of smooth muscle that surround the lens. Uh, these are the, this is the area that gives uh, changing shape to the lens. The vascular layer continued 
We have the suspensory ligaments, which connect the ciliary body to the lens. Uh, these ligaments allow for contraction and relaxation, which changes the shape of the lens to focus light. Uh, those of you who don't have to wear glasses and have really good eyes, when you're reading a book, your lens is, has one shape. When you're watching television, uh, your lens has a different shape. And when you're driving and looking off into the distance, it has still another shape. And all of those changes in shape are brought about by the suspensory ligaments. The iris is the colored region of the eye. Uh, it is an extension of the vascular layer. The amount of pigment or melanin determines iris color. Uh, if you've ever seen, uh, for instance, a uh, albino rabbit or an albino rat, uh, you notice that they have pink eyes. The reason they have pink eyes is they are not producing any melanin in their eyes and in the iris. And what you are actually seeing is the blood flow that is going through that part of the eye. The pupil is the opening in the center of the eye or center of the iris through which light enters the eyeball. Uh, the pupil is actually the opening. Uh, it is not a true structure. It's just a name given to the opening in the eye. And again, there is the pupil, the suspensory ligaments, again, changing shape of the lens. Uh, there's the iris or the colored part of the eye and the croyoid down here. Uh, the vascular layer, the pupillary sphincter muscle, is found in the iris. It contracts due to parasympathetic stimulation. Uh, this is what reduces the size of the pupil, restricts the amount of light entering the eye. As the light uh, becomes brighter and brighter, the pupil becomes smaller and smaller. <clears throat> As the light diminishes, then the pupil then uh, relaxes. Uh, the pupillary sphincter muscle makes the, eye, makes the iris smaller or the pupil smaller. The pupillary dilator makes it increase or makes it larger, uh, allows the pupil to increase in size, more light to enter the eyeball. It contracts during sympathetic activation. So parasympathetic for the pupillary sphincter, sympathetic for the pupillary dilator. And again, here is someone who has a light shining in their face, normal ambient room light, and then we start to darken the room, turn the lights down, and the pupil gets bigger. The neural layer, the innermost layer of the eyeball, also known as the retina, uh, is an incomplete layer. Uh, it is only found deep to the choroid. Uh, it is composed of two layers, the superficial and deep. The superficial layer is a thin pigmented epithelium, uh, reduces uh, the scattering of light that can occur and nourishes the photoreceptors. Uh, the deep layer consists of the photoreceptor cells and cells for the optic nerve. Uh, photoreceptor cells detect and transduce light stimuli into electrical signals. You have two types of receptor cells. There are rods and cones. Uh, the rods give us our black and white vision uh, in low lights and also our peripheral vision. The cones are high acuity color vision and higher light levels are in higher light levels. Uh, you may have heard that dogs are colorblind. And that someone may have told you that at some point in your life. Dogs are not technically colorblind, but they do not see in as many colors as you and I do. And the reason they do not see in as many colors as we do is because of the number of cones that they have. The rods are good for black and white vision. And again, cones, high acuity color vision. The more cones you have, the more different colors you can differentiate. Uh, you know, if you've ever seen an artist's color wheel, there's like 50 different shades of blue. <clears throat> well, if you don't have very many cones, like a dog, all of those shades of blue look pretty much the same. There are several other types uh, of cells found in the neural layer, including those that give rise to the optic nerve. Uh, the aura serrata is the visible boundary between the anterior edge of the retina and the posterior edge of the ciliary body. Uh, that's what we meant on this previous slide, that it was an incomplete layer because it doesn't go around the complete inner surface of the eyeball. 
it's only found on the back uh, two thirds, <clears throat> excuse me, two thirds to three quarters of the eyeball. The, <clears throat> the macula lutea is a yellowish central region of the fovea, contains a large number of photoreceptors. <clears throat> the fovea centralis is the central region of the macula lutea, contains a large number of cones. They're packed very tightly together, which allows for the detailed vision and ability to focus on objects. Uh, macular degeneration, <clears throat> excuse me, you may have heard of that, leads to progressive loss of visual acuity, uh, particularly in the central field of vision. Uh, may also cause visual distortion and changes in color perception. Uh, there's lots of things uh, being advertised on television uh, about medications for macular degeneration. Uh, macular degeneration is something uh, that uh, diabetics worry about considerably. Uh, the optic disc is located where the axons of the optic nerve exit from the retina. Uh, it does not contain any photoreceptors. It does not capture visual energy, uh, or excuse me, images, and it is referred to as your blind spot. Uh, layers of the retina are in contact with each other but are not physically linked by desmosomes or tight junctions. Uh, therefore, certain conditions like trauma, diabetes, or an abnormally shaped eyeball can pull the inner layer away from the pigmented layer uh, in a condition known as a detached retina. Uh, this isolates the photoreceptors from the blood supply, and permanent loss of vision can occur if a detached retina is not corrected within several days. There was a, a baseball player. Oh, golly, none of y'all are old enough to remember many, many years ago uh, who was just playing the outfield one day and started having blurred vision, and um, he went and uh, got uh, checked out, and his, his retinas had detached. He was a diabetic, had been a, had been a type 2 diabetic for several years. His retinas detached, uh, and he basically went blind in just a very, very short amount of time uh, from detached retinas. Uh, again, here is the back side of the eyeball. There's the branches of the central uh, retinal artery. There's the optic disc. Uh, there's the fovea centralis, the macula lutea. And again, this is the area that would start to, to degenerate during macular degeneration. Uh, the eyeball, again, uh, blind spot. Uh, this is to test your left eye, cover your right eye, and focus on the X, slowly move your book towards or away from you until the dot disappears. That will be your blind spot. And to test your left eye, do the same, and you will eventually, the two sides of the pencil will come together, the broken pencil will come together uh, at your blind spot. The lens is a slightly flattened sphere behind the pupil and the iris. Uh, it focuses light on the retina from objects near the eye. Uh, again, the ciliary body is connected to the lens by the suspensory ligaments. Uh, the lens contains cells or lens fibers that lack nuclei. They're very, very tightly packed. And again, they lay in parallel rows, which what gives the lens its translucent uh, appearance. Again, cross-section, here is the lens here. The lens, as you've seen, if you dissected the cow eye, uh, the, 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 the lens in death uh, is not as clear, but keep in mind that the lens, the cornea, this part of your eye is clear. This part is translucent. Uh, it is not as clear as the cornea, but light can pass through. And again, there is a blow up version of the macula lutea right there. Uh, transparent lenses is essential for vision. If light cannot pass through the lens, vision is impaired. Even if there are functional photoreceptors, most common lens issue uh, that human beings suffer from, and it's not just human beings. I had a dog that had cataracts uh, several years ago, uh, but a cloudy lens is a cataract a very frequent cause of blindness. Uh, cataracts can be caused by trauma. 
<clears throat> exposure to UV radiation, diseases such as diabetes. Uh, that's why it's very important for diabetics uh, to always keep a very good relationship with your eye doctor. Uh, the most common cause of cataracts, however, is simply aging. The lens fibers tend to progressively darken and become less organized, turning the uh, lens a sort of milky white. Uh, people uh, with very bad cataracts kind of look like they're wearing a sort of cream colored contact lens. Uh, cataracts cannot be reversed. Uh, the treatment, there are some treatments. Uh, they can replace the entire lens surgically with a synthetic lens, uh, which restores vision. Uh, glasses or contact lens may be required for minor adjustments, but again, the big issue cataracts cannot be reversed. Uh, the cavities and chambers of the eye, the eyeball is divided into anterior and posterior cavities by the lens and the ciliary body. The posterior cavity is the larger of the cavity found behind the lens filled with a gelatinous material called the vitreous humor. The vitreous humor is made of mostly collagen and water. Uh, it presses the retina against the choroid and helps maintain the shape of the eyeball. The anterior cavity uh, is in front of the eyes and the ciliary body. Further divides, it's further divided, excuse me, into anterior and posterior chambers, both filled with a fluid called the aqueous humor. Uh, the posterior chamber is between the lens and the iris. The anterior chamber is between the iris and the cornea. Uh, the aqueous humor is a watery substance. Uh, it is secreted by the ciliary body. It flows from the posterior chamber through the pupil into the anterior chamber. Uh, it is drained from the anterior chamber or from the anterior cavity into the scleral venous sinus. Uh, in the scleral venal, scleral venous sinus, uh, that is a blood vessel network at the anterior edge of the iris, drains the aqueous humor out of the anterior chamber. Here's the thing about these two humors. The vitreous humor found in the posterior cavity cannot be replaced if it is lost due to some trauma. The aqueous humor, on the other hand, is continually made and uh, regenerated. And again, here is the vitreous humor in the posterior cavity. It's what gives the eyeball its overall shape. Here is the posterior chamber of the anterior cavity. And here is the anterior chamber of the anterior cavity. Uh, one more thing we'll talk about eyeballs and then I'm going to take a break. Glaucoma. Uh, again, uh, another condition with the eyes. If you've ever gone to the eye doctor and they took that little probe uh, and punched your, you know, they put a little drop in your eye to deaden your eye and they put this little thing that looks eh, similar to uh, kind of like a, uh, a, a no touch thermometer and they touch the surface of your eyeball or in the old days. You would have to sit there with your eyes open really wide and they would blow a puff of air into your eye. That's testing for glaucoma. Uh, glaucoma occurs when the aqueous, aqueous humor cannot drain and the fluid builds up in the anterior or posterior chamber. Uh, that excess fluid raises pressure inside the eyeball, which is called the interocular pressure. Uh, this elevated pressure pushes on the vitreous humor, which then compresses and damages the retina and optic nerve. Uh, glaucoma is the second leading cause of blindness uh, amongst humans. Uh, glaucoma can result from eye infections, certain medications, or congenital defects in the scleral venous sinus. Uh, however, in most cases, the overall cause is unknown. Uh, most people who have glaucoma do not have any symptoms other than gradual loss of vision. Uh, and this can occur so slowly that it may not be detected until the disease is advanced. Uh, unfortunately, the lost vision cannot be restored. Progression can be stopped or slowed with medications to, that either improve the drainage or reduce the amounts of aqueous humor being produced. If medications fail to control the pressure, uh, surgical procedures may improve the drainage as well. 
that's why it's again very important to have a good relationship with your eye doctor they will do a glaucoma test and if they they see uh, that increased pressure then they will uh, take the proper steps let's stop there for a minute with the eyeball and we will pick up a little bit later